Two more interviews to go. You know which one this is, because the house is full, and I can tell that all of you are excited. So without further ado, let's jump right into it. Next up, we have Vitalik Buterin from the Ethereum Foundation, and we're going to talk about all things scaling. <laughs> Welcome, V. And the mic's uh, behind you. There's no mic behind me? Oh, amazing. It's a mic. Okay. Um, what is the mic on? I believe it is. Um, OK, well, I, I accidentally offed it. But now maybe I on it again, so it's on. OK. Happy Pi Day. Oh, um, oh, is it half tau, half tau Day already? It's amazing, <laughs> yeah. Mm. Well, happy Half Tau Day to you. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, there's a lot of things we want to talk about. But uh, what we're going to do is mostly focus on the, the roll-up, or rather it's just the, the scaling roadmap for Ethereum. Let's, let's not go into roll-ups directly. Um, yesterday was a really amazing day. Mm -hmm. uh, you want those days to be more non-eventful because mm -hmm. the upgrade went really well. Yeah. And blobs are now finally here. Mm -hmm. So we're already seeing 90 to 95% reduction in transaction fees. Some of that went instantly for a lot of the, the layer twos. Does that mean we've solved scaling now? Well, I mean, so at the end of last year, I uh, published, um, you know, the updated version of these uh, roadmap uh, diagrams that I've published a couple of times, right, which are basically summarizing the perspectives of uh, a lot of different, um, you know, developers and researchers that I uh, talked to and have been tracking. And the f they're in the, uh, the surge part of that uh, roadmap, which deals with uh, scaling. Uh, we had uh, two big milestones. There is basic roll-up scaling and full roll-up scaling. And for basic roll-up scaling, it had like basically two main prerequisites. One of them is getting proto dank sharding, EIP4844. And the other one is getting at least one roll-up to what I call stage one, which is basically a point where it at least partially actually relies on working fraud proofs that are implemented and running in the code, right? And Arbitrum has uh, been, done a great job of just like leading way ahead of everyone on that. Um, and uh, now we have um, you know, blobs as of yesterday, and I think as of uh, you know, a couple of days from now, the two will link and uh, Arbitrum will actually be using the blobs. Um, so you know, we have officially hit basic Roll up scaling. Ooh. Ding, 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 ding. Um, but, but, you know, we still have uh, full roll up scaling to go. Uh, but I think uh, the big thing to keep in mind is that from here it's like very incremental, right? Um, so, for example, the uh, EIP4844 structure was designed in a lot of ways to be very forward compatible with very smoothly updating things from here, right? So like for example, to get from where we are today, which is uh, three blobs a block, um, you know, three, about 375 uh, kilobytes, to full dank sharding with uh, you know, ideally 16 megabytes every slot, the only hard forking change that's required is a parameter change. Everything else is just a different validation strategy. It's just something that nodes can improve um, uh, kind of on the side passively, even at different, uh, uh, different times and at different rates. And it's not something that I mean, it really needs to disrupt the functioning of the network, right? So that's one thing. And then the other thing is that the, uh, the, the pre-compile was um, intentionally designed to return the modulus. Um, and this is um, you know, the prime number that uh, every all all of the math wraps around. And the goal of that is to make it possible to also upgrade that over time um, in the future in such a way that rollups would also be able to just uh, kind of automatically um, adapt to whatever the new modulus is, right? And so what this means, practically speaking, is eventually we will, I think, uh, move over from being based on KZG and um, you know, kind of elliptic curves and uh, the trusted setup and all that to Starks, which are no tr fully trusted setup free and quantum resistant. And like it makes sense to do that when the technology is ready, but that might require changing the modulus, maybe making it 64-bit or something, right? But like these are things that we're already forward compatible for, right? So basically, uh, things have been set up already in such a way that most of the ecosystem really uh, needs to do either very little work or pretty much no work at all um, in order to accommodate the rest of the uh, scaling roadmap as it's going to come um, going into the future. That's awesome. So yeah. you kind of covered a lot and you kind of uh, already mm -hmm. foreshadowed a lot of the, the roadmap here. But mm -hmm. from the merge to the purge, Hmm. Were those two things, uh, sort of the, the only two outstanding things that you talked about, which is 4844 and actually like the, the, the sorry, level one roll-ups or yeah, so, what's so the, okay, so basic roll-up scaling um, required um, 
I mean, this is kind of arbitrary, you know, these are milestones. Milestones are arbitrary because miles are arbitrary. Um, but, uh, you know, the, uh, basically, uh, you know, one was uh, 4844 and the other is uh, rollups being at stage one. What the milestone called full rollup scaling uh, requires uh, full dank sharding, including like fully working data availability sampling, um, and it also requires stage two rollups where their security kind of actually only depends on the code, right? Um, so, you know, like fully, yeah, either removing, I mean, what we call security councils or making them only active in cases where the code clearly has a bug because it's disagreeing with itself. Got it. Mm -hmm. So, how do we think about the remainder of those stages? So, mm -hmm. what comes after the search? Well, remember, there's no after. These are parallel, right? They're not. Oh, oh that's, good, that's yes. a good point. That's a really good point. Yeah, so the six are, there is uh, the merge, which is proof of stake, and uh, the merge itself is done, but at some point, upgrades to proof of stake, particularly single solid finality, are going to come. Then we have uh, the uh, surge, which is about increasing scalability. It talks about that. Then we have the verge, which is likely to be the next big theme, and uh, like, or at least the next big theme to hit a milestone. Um, and uh, the verge is about initially vertical trees, then about verification, and generally the theme is making it easier to run a node. So, you know, who here runs a, uh, or has recently run a verifying Ethereum node? Geth, Nethermind, um, you know, any of those? Okay, who here wants to? Who here would do it if the hard, hard disk requirements were reduced to zero? Who here would do it if the sync time was reduced from like a couple of days to like basically 10 minutes? Um, and keep that in mind then if, uh, if there's a bug and you want to like kind of re, you know, restart the whole thing, that also means that the process to resync is going to go down from like two days to 10 minutes. Um, who here would be willing to solo stake if solo staking did not require a hard drive and um, you know, if you had to change the setup and only required 10 minutes of downtime instead of two, uh, two days? So this is what the ver um, Who here would uh, be willing to verify the full chain if uh, not only did it not require a hard drive, but instead of verifying a block, you were only verifying a snark of a block. And so the whole uh, verification process only uh, took like a few dozen kilobytes um, of uh, data and like possibly 10 milliseconds of computation. Who here knows what a snark is? Um, who, here knows what, uh, who here wants to know what a snark is? Um, who here knows what a shark is? It's an older type of proof, um, actually. It's, uh, I think, uh, published in 2018 or so. Um, who here has watched the movie Sharknado? <laughs> One, two, or three. <laughs> okay, good, three. Um, okay, see, so, uh, you know, the, this, things like this are what The Verge is about, right? Like, we're, no, we're about verifying the chain, and we want to make it as easy as possible to verify the chain, like, and we want, like, actually verifying the chain to be a default for people, right? And uh, vertical trees and snarking the EVM and all of these things are fundamentally all about that. Then, and then another big one is what we call the purge. Uh, the purge is basically about simplifying the chain, removing unneeded features, removing old history, simplifying the code, um, and uh, reducing the, uh, the load that uh, nodes uh, need to have. So one big piece of uh, the purge is uh, EIP4444, uh, which uh, it basically means that uh, regular nodes uh, by default do not have to store the uh, entire um, execution uh, history. Um, so that's going to also reduce the... Uh, the the state storage requirements of a node um, massively, right? So vertical trees hand, um, basically mean you don't have to store the state. 4444 basically means that you don't have to store the, uh, um, you know, the old history. And so both of those really, you know, really work together. Um, and uh, there's also just like a whole bunch of protocol and code simplifications. Uh, so one big one that happened yesterday is uh, the self-destruct opcode now only uh, works if like basically if you call it in the same transaction as when a contract gets created. And that basically, yeah, like it doesn't quite remove the opcode. I think we do want to remove the opcode eventually, but um, you know, that will happen uh, realistically a bit later just to give... Can, um, can you tell us why that should be removed? Yes, okay, so well, the reason why the opcode got nerfed and is uh, basically that the problem is that self-destruct lets you kill a contract even if the contract had an arbitrarily large number of storage slots. 
And what this means is that there is no upper bound on the amount of state within it that could change within a single block, right? If there is a single contract that had like a million different objects in it, then within a single block, if you self-destruct that contract, then all million of those objects go away. Handling this edge case, and especially handling, you know, the possibility that like things might get reverted and all kinds of complexity, is what what something that requires a pretty large amount of extra code on the part of client developers. Now that self-destruct is gone, we actually do have a hard limit on the number of uh, storage slots uh, that can change in a block, and so a lot of things for client developers become much easier. Then, uh, in recently, um, the GEF uh, devs, um, I believe, uh, you know, pushed a uh, PR to remove uh, the, uh, the ability to support uh, pre-merge um, Ethereum. Um, and uh, there is also, I think, an uh, EIP to remove uh, the uh, need to support the concept of warm and cold um, accounts, which is like a very technically ugly thing that got temporarily introduced um, as a result of the 2016 DOS attacks. So, like, basically, just like a lot of like protocol technical debt and protocol garbage that got accumulated over the years. Like, the goal is to like actually try to clean it out over time, right? To make basically, you know, we do not want the Ethereum protocol to be something that just kind of keeps on accumulating junk and becoming ugly and uglier and worse over time, right? We want it to become cleaner. And uh, the purge is about that. And, um, you know, it's about making uh, users' uh, um, lives easier in terms of reducing the amount that they have to, s the, the, uh, amount that they have to store and, um, you know, making client devs easier in terms of, uh, you know, reducing the kinds of uh, things that a, uh, a basic Ethereum node needs to support. Um, so that's the purge. Then uh, you have the, the splurge, which is kind of a catch-all for pretty much everything else, right? So account abstraction, um, EVM improvements, um, making the EVM uh, kind of more friendly to supporting advanced cryptography, EOF, a lot of developers are excited about that. Um, there, there are a, a bunch of other is it, ones. Is it actually just catch-all, or is it meant to just still have a few key things that you still want to improve? Yeah, I mean, I think uh, EVM improvements, especially ELF and account abstraction, are kind of the two keystones. But, I mean, aside from that, it's definitely pretty catch-all. And then, finally, there is uh, the scourge, which is uh, dealing with economic centralization risk and uh, mitigating it, right? So the bi one bi a big one of these is uh, MEV. Another big one is issues that have to do with liquid staking. And um, you know, there might be other centralization risks that also come to time and come up from time to time and basically dealing with that and making sure that the Ethereum protocol continues to remain decentralized and uh, resilient against all of those risks. Mm -hmm. Are those mostly we know what the solution is, we just have to implement it and you have to slowly kind of pace mm -hmm. out when you get to deploy these releases, mm -hmm. or is it that these are, some of them are actually open problems, I'm sure I maybe will remain yeah. partially open uh, for, for a while? Um, I think actually most of the, most of them are at this point just engineering tasks. That's actually great. Yeah. Yeah, and I think um, this is, I think this gets to like one point and kind of uh, one of the broader philosophical points that I think is uh, really important to think about, right? Which is that uh, the Ethereum ecosystem is um, in the pr process of making a uh, very big uh, transition where the way that I see it is uh, the first decade of Ethereum is Ethereum being this kind of mostly inwardly focused ecosystem, you know, developing things for itself, um, you know, focused on, you know, being tech geeks trying to satisfy tech geeks and um, you know, creating beautiful technology. Um, and, but the second decade of Ethereum needs to be Ethereum really breaking out and actually having a big impact in the real world, right? And like this requires a mindset shift on the part of basically all different of the different layers of the ecosystem. Um, and, you know, on the uh, side of uh, core developers, I mean, definitely less attention on layer one issues in general. And I think layer one in general is going to shift over heavily from a kind of rapid change to maintenance. And um, you know, I think a, a couple of years ago, I think at a presentation at ECC, I, uh, I, I showed this kind of S-curve diagram where at the beginning, the protocol you know, changed slowly, and then around for, you know, for the last couple of years, it's really ramped up to change quickly, and then it's uh, going back to changing slowly again. And I think at this point, we're actually well on, now that um, you know, Den Kuhn is done, we are well on the uh, decel 
accelerating side of the S curve. So you know the biggest uh, changes I uh, actually think are behind us, which is uh, amazing. I mean, there definitely are still big changes remaining, right? But uh, you know the merge was huge, right? Yeah. And I mean even uh, blobs were huge, right? And even the philosophical shift from layer one focused Ethereum to layer two focused Ethereum was huge, right? But like at this point, I mean, we're the like there aren't shifts of that level of magnitude still are really still ahead of us at this like there are shifts that are maybe kind of you know like one step smaller than that um but uh, at this point it's like getting to where doing much more iterative stuff right which is what you want and that's the it desire is. exactly it is what we want um and uh, the other big thing i think is uh, that uh, you know the primary locus of attention really needs to shift from uh, you know just uh, core development uh, to application developers right and what's interesting in the application development space, right, is that the number of tools that we have gained to build um, um, applications with is, uh, you know, over the last couple of years, pretty massive, right? I mean, I think a really big one, for example, is zero knowledge proofs, right? Like you're able to build applications that are much more scalable and build applications that do a better job of preserving users' privacy. And the ease of doing that has gone, gone up massively, right? Five years ago, to build a zero knowledge proof application, you had to be a cryptographer yourself. Now you basically just have to speak Circom. And I mean, I'm sure in two years, we'll dump Circom and you'll be able to just like write things I mean, like in a much more normy VM language, right? Uh, so We're already seeing that. I mean, people are just modifying ZK VMs and uh, just doing DSLs to just compile into different circuits. Already. Indeed. I mean, I, yeah, I mean, one note of caution here, I think, is like, I do think that as an ecosystem, we should value like minimizing lines of code. And I do think that, you know, like a lot of traditional languages don't do a great job of valuing that, right? Like, things should be inspectable at, bi at, at you know, like whatever the equivalent of binary level is, right? And, uh, you know, like, like that's just a security thing, right? Like, I think, uh, you know, the system should be intelligible even at its lower levels. And, you know, like that's not something that we do a perfect job of, you know, definitely far from that, but that's uh, definitely something, you know, we should try to improve on, and it's definitely not something that we should be trying to uh, move even further away from, right? Um, but, uh, yeah, I mean, the la I think, um, you know, the languages that we use are definitely going to move toward, um, you know, being more familiar um, and uh, being... Uh, um, Higher level, or? exactly. Yeah, and being higher level at the same uh, at the same time. Yeah. Um, so that's one big thing. Um, I think uh, another big thing to think about is like, if you're building a major kind of type of application or even a major piece of infrastructure, it's important to like really think about it, like make sure that the thing that you're building today is being built in kind of an Ethereum 2.0 frame instead of an Ethereum 1.0 frame. And sorry, and I guess what's the, the actual thing to remember? On it? What's yes, the takeaway okay. of the framing? Yeah, um, so I mean, I know, you know, the terms Ethereum 1.0 and 2.0 have been used to mean like 20 different things over the years, but uh, like what I mean here is, right, like, so for example, um, like let's just like bucket things, right? Um, so Ethereum 1.0 frame, everything on layer one. Ethereum 2.0 frame, layer two first. Um, Ethereum 1.0 frame, everything in the clear dumped on chain. Ethereum 2.0 frame, um, you know, Z, uh, ZK'd um, and inside a ZK wallet, hashes on chain and uh, like information stored privately and uh, you know, you prove it on an as, ne um, as needed basis. Um, 1.0 frame, uh, the uh, only anti sybil me mechanism is like, you know, basically how much ETH you have. 2.0 frame, you have that, but you also have Gitcoin passports, um, you know, you have Worldcoin IDs, um, you have uh, other, you know, like proof of personhood systems, you have proof of humanity, um, you have, you know, Pope's proof of attendance, you have zoo stamps, like, you know, you have this, like, this kind of entire zoo of, um, you know, ways of uh, kind of like telling, you know, who is a, a person and who is not, or who is a community member and who is not, and like, these are things that we should be taking advantage of, right? Um, wallets, um, you know, a 1.0 frame EOA, a 2.0 frame accounts. smart contract, smart contract accounts, and I um, mean, you know, with uh, guardians for recovery, right? So you know, you can kind of go down the stack, right? And building something today with a 1.0 frame in mind just makes zero sense, right? Like if you're making something that exists today that has a uh, one that, that is built with a 1.0 frame, you know, you should be quietly building the 2.0 version and like figuring out the upgrade path to it. Uh, out of curiosity, do you mm. run into scenarios where you're seeing this is mm. consistent of behavior for you to uh, kind of 
promote the 2.0 thinking because mm. one thing that I, we've mm. seen definitely from mm. ETH Global is the mm. fact that mm. the crowd just gets diluted every year because there's so many more people coming in the next year. Right. So, but they default to the new behaviors that everybody's mm. building with and yeah. you just don't actually see the same patterns as even the year before. Mm. So I'm curious. Yeah. I mean, I think see. that's good. I mean, I think uh, the thing to keep in mind is actually, yeah, protocols that have been around for a long time, right? So like Pope, for example, I um, you know, would be a good example, right? Like I think Pope should, um, you know, and, uh, and hopefully does have a, uh, a, a very active and high priority roadmap for, uh, you know, switching to ZK verification and uh, switching to everything being on L2s. Um, Gitcoin Passport, um, you know, same thing. I see. So this is yeah. more of a call for existing protocols to also help transition themselves to this right. versus just a advice for people starting now. Exactly. Yeah, and it like gets. Uh, you know, it is both, right? And uh, like, if you're, and then if you're building something, then um, you know, your chances are you're going to be integrating with existing things, and um, you know, make sure that the things that you're integrating with themselves are, you know, the the, the 2.0 things that are in the process of being built now. Hmm. It's a very very helpful um, general advice. Uh, hmm. One one other thing, uh, I do want to kind of switch topics, but one last thing here is uh, hmm. let's talk about data availability. So uh, obviously uh, blobs are here. They've simplified a lot of things. We now hmm. have kind of DA systems out there, mm -hmm. um, and you kind of have uh, technologies like Avail and Celestia and uh, yeah. and uh, Eigenlayer. But at the same time, Ethereum also has expressed interest in being the DA layer at the end. Mm -hmm. um, how should we think about that? And uh, are mm -hmm. there any kind of conflicts we see, or are mm -hmm. there any issues with now multiple sort of mm -hmm. perspectives on this? Yeah, I mean, I see it as a uh, scale and security trade off, right? Like, if you want to have top security, then you know, your DA layer has to be the same as your settlement layer, right? Uh, because uh, if your DA layer is separate from your settlement layer, then you know, there is the risk that the DA layer gets 51% attacked and then you're screwed, right? Whereas uh, you know, if uh, your DA layer is the same as your settlement layer, then actually, even if it gets 51% attacked, I mean, your, your, your application is safe, which is something that I think uh, a lot of people don't appreciate enough, right? Um, so that's um, like I view it kind of on an application by application basis. Um, so uh, you know, if you're building something financial, then um, you know absolutely should be on you know like proper rollups. Um, if uh, you're building you know like ENS, I mean like also should be on proper rollups. But if you're building like games, for example, right, then. Uh, like games should do not need to be on rollups. So like if a game is on some you know a custom DA layer, then like that's probably totally fine for that game. Um, another example of this is uh, if you look at the enterprise um, you know blockchain space, right? Like who here remembers uh, back in like 2014 to 2018, where you know you had like the corporate big shots talking about how permission blockchains were in the future? Who here remembers this? Good. Um, All of them. Yeah. Uh, so. The, w the way that I kind of like, like look at that uh, from uh, you know, looking back at that space is basically that like the idea that for, uh, for some applications a compromise between centralization and decentralization is just the correct, is the correct thing for practicality is a completely correct idea. But I think permissioned blockchains are, were just a totally bungled and failed attempt at actually, at actually executing on that idea. W why, right? Uh, because, basically because like it just ended up that permissioned uh, blockchains are too centralized to appeal to the decentralization community, and uh, you know they're they're too decentralized to have the the same efficiencies that are expected by the centralized people, and so they ended up you know not really satisfying either camp, right? I guess in this definition, uh, do you mm -hmm. kind of consider a rollup without open fraud proofs a uh, permission blockchain? That's a good question. I mean, I guess it is, right? Yeah. Yeah. So you know. Gotcha. Who here runs a rollup without open fraud proofs? No admissions, okay. Um, but if you do, then you know you got to be migrating to you know having an actual fraud proof. <laughs> Who here is migrating to having an actual fraud proof? Okay, no hands. Um, okay, but uh, you should be. Um, yeah. Who here has a family? <laughs> you should be migrating your family to open fraud proofs. <laughs> Yeah, um, so basically, um, 
I think like that, that like what, what ended up happening with a lot of these projects, right, is that um, you know they were able to get like a few users, but then once the time came for them to get uh, like a larger set of people, like uh, the the next wave of potential users basically looked at the thing and they're like, hey, you know, this is a JP Morgan chain. What's the point, right? Um, and uh, like I think with zk proofs and layer um, you know, like layer two technology and validiums and all of this stuff, we actually have an opportunity to make the thing that permission blockchains should have been, which, which is validiums that commit into the public Ethereum blockchain, right? What is a validium for A validium is basically a system that has private state and um, you know, like everything happens on, kind of on its own system, could even be on a server, but which publishes Merkle roots to Ethereum and which publishes your uh, ZK snarks to Ethereum that prove that the Merkle proofs were updated correctly, right? So, so, so any sort of ZK proof is by definition a validium? Uh, well, if it's a yeah, ZK proof whose goal it is to like, basically prove that a spreadsheet is being updated in ways that follows the rules. Um, so the reason why I think uh, this kind of technology is nice is like it basically it's kind of like a convergence from um, you know like thinking about it from uh, you know the, the, the centralized perspective and from the decentralized perspective right because the decentralized perspective is basically we have rollups rollups are too expensive for some things even with blobs and rollups are overkill so let's take the data off chain and you have a validium. The centralized perspective is we have a server and we want to just add some extra security assurances onto that server to you know, con convince our users that we're being honest and even you know, to give our users the ability to like, have proofs that they could then go and potentially I mean, like, send off to third parties and maybe even use them as collateral for things, right? Um, but, and, and then how do you do that? Well, you already have a database. Well, let's just like, add this kind of extra side sidecar to your existing database code, which just publishes updates to your database to chain, like, or, which makes Merkle roots of your database, publishes those Merkle roots to chain, and then also generates a proof that the Merkle root was computed and updated correctly, and publishes those proofs to chain as well, right? Unlike a permission blockchain, this is just a sidecar. It's like just an add-on to an existing centralized thing that does not require changes to your existing workflow, right? And so it's something that's like pretty simple to add. Um, um, actually, yeah, from the yeah, crypto spaces point of view, um, if you think about centralized exchanges, one prob probably the first major example of this kind of like enterprise volatility that I think is going to take off is uh, exchange proof of solvency, right? I mean, We've already seen attempts from some Indeed, of the we've seen lots of attempts. Proof of solvency has been a theme for a long time, right? But like zero knowledge proofs, I think, are by far the best technology to like really actually do this. And you know, it's really valuable, right? If exchanges can like actually prove to the to the public that, like, for every coin of deposits that they have, they actually have a corresponding coin, and they're not being fractional reserves, right? You know, proof of not being Mt. Gox, proof of not being FTX. Um, so, the. Uh, like, if you think about the kind of technology that's involved in doing this, it's like basically actually the same as being a Validium, right? And so you could basically think of this like as both from the perspective of like, you know, we try to be decentralized, but we need to cut costs, and think of it from the perspective of, well, you know, we start off being centralized, but we want to try to get some of the benefits of like actually being um, like some secure and uh, trust-free and providing better guarantees to our users. And those two kind of converge at this point in the middle that like actually makes some sense, I think, in a way that permission blockchains never made sense. Um, so, this is, um, you know, the kind of, you know, the pitch for enterprise, right? This is also, I mean, not even just enterprise, right? It's like a, a pretty major, um, you know, category of applications that includes games, that includes lots of other things. Um, but I think, um, you know, the end of the, uh, like, the conclusion of all this, right, is that, like, there is a large set of things for which Ethereum data availability is overkill. And, like, for, in, for some of those, a server is enough. For some of those, I mean, like something Celestia or Argument. Other like services can happily uh, take and, over. Uh, you know, for some of that, um, you know, the, the committee of, um, you know, you and your high school friend is also enough. Um, so, you know, I just like, you know, choose the points on that committee that makes sense. And for the stuff that really needs the security, um, you know, we got the blobs. That helps me understand data availability mm -hmm. for, uh, for long term yeah. Ethereum. Um, mm -hmm. I do want to change topics a little bit uh, mm. and get into some, uh, some final questions. Mm. Uh, you recently turned 30, mm. and uh, you made a wonderful blog post about mm. the last 10 years of uh, mm -hmm. being in this space and uh, mm -hmm. some of the things that you personally cared about. Mm -hmm. uh, what were kind of, would you mind highlighting some of the learnings from uh, being in this world for the last 10 years? 
the crypto world, that is. Mm -hmm. <laughs> hmm. Yeah, I mean, the, the crypto world, I think, it, like, it's just worth, I mean, you know, thinking back and remembering, like, the space has changed a huge amount over the last 10 years, right? Um, it's like, an understatement. Who here remembers um, you know, the, uh, the Bitcoin uh, block size war and Bitcoin cash? Who here remembers uh, Craig Satoshi Wright? <laughs> Actually, a judge, I think, ruled like today or yesterday that he's not Satoshi. Um, so, you know, I think, uh, you know, we're allowed. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, who here remembers Silk Road? <laughs> who here remembers the Dow? The, yeah, the, the Dow. Yes. Um, the the Olympic test net. Um, the uh, um, eth Ethereum DevCon one in London, which happens in a venue barely bigger than this one. Who here was at DevCon one in London? Oh, I'd be curious on that one. Yeah, see a couple Only of people. One, yes, yeah, I yeah, see you. I see two heads. Yeah, yeah. See, like, there's just you know we've just like seen so many different and um, you know fascinating phenomena uh, kind of come and go. I um, mean, um, you know, the space has just become its own culture, and uh, you know, it's come to have its own history. And I think first of all, it's just uh, you know really uh, important to remember that. It's um, you know really important to appreciate that. Um, it's. Uh, I think um, you know. Also, just good to um, you know look back at some of the the previous eras and um, you know remember kind of both their downsides and uh, you know also remember their benefits. Um, so, like I think um, like for example, you know it definitely became fashionable to hate on ICOs a while back. But I think it's uh, like it's also important to remember some of the big benefits of ICOs. Um, like one of the really beautiful things about ICOs to me is how they allow projects to like have this community that's like really truly global right like you actually had people from the US people from Europe people from Thailand people from China people from all kinds of places just like all you know like buy in and like actually be, become part of the yeah, community of the same project right and often you know buying the tokens is their entry point but then you know like really believing in the ideals and uh, actually you know like being part of this collective global thing is uh, you know, like, really, like, like it is a yeah, transition that's really happened to a lot of people, right? And like that is something that does still happen, right? I, uh, I remember uh, when I was in Singapore uh, last year, I went to one of these, um, you know, like crazy DGen parties in uh, Token 2049, and I remember just like asking around, like, um, you know, basically, why are you here? And at least a couple of times I heard the answer, like, I came here to make money, but, um, you know, can, like, basically now I real, I'm, you know, I'm realizing that it's more interesting than that. Um, so, like, the, the problem with uh, the current era a lot of the time, right, is, like, if the main way to pay for things get, is basically getting funding from VCs, then, I mean, first of all, like, uh, you know, the things, the kinds of things that get funded are, are, are going to be the kinds of things that are agreeable to VCs, which are a, uh, you know, they are a more limited group of people that do all talk to each other. Um, then... They're not necessarily even more ethical than token buy than individual well, it, token buyers. It's not even that, right? Yeah, I, I think uh, the the one yeah. argument I would make on this thing is that yeah. most yeah. businesses are small businesses. They they're, yeah. they don't have to be billion dollar businesses. You can yeah. have a small business yeah. that yeah. offers a value to a small set of people. Look, look at yeah. hundreds and thousands of restaurants just in the next block radius, mm -hmm. yeah. um, and those can now be mm -hmm. based off of interest in community and community yeah. and just people who care about those specific exactly. things. Yeah, absolutely, right. But and I think uh, you know, like actually having those uh, ways to like really uh, create a project in a way that it kind of like it bootstraps in this fair and even way, where you know, like anyone gets to participate at the same terms. Um, you know, no, um, you know, like volume discounts, no key influencer pro privileges, none of that crap. Just uh, you know, buy in. The price is two thousand to one. Um, I think uh, you know, like that, like that's a, a spirit that's um, you know really beautiful, right? And uh, you know, you get just like a whole bunch of people from um, you know, like all um, around the world coming in. And I think that there's like lots of different ways to actually yeah, accomplish this, right? But uh, like you actually, like you get this kind of, you know, like very kind of genuine confluence of uh, just like a whole bunch of different people that believe in the thing and that, um, you know, come in and uh, 
part participating in the thing um, on the same terms as everyone else, and it starts um, you know going from there, right? And like that kind of spirit is uh, definitely a yeah, spirit that I think is uh, it, it is unique to the crypto space. Um, it definitely is being exported a little bit, right? Um, so I don't know if people saw, but recently, yeah, Reddit has been, um, you know, doing like, you know, preparing to do their IPO, and uh, they're announcing that uh, like people who have been active in the yeah, Reddit community, yeah, as you know, moderators and like frequent contributors, they're able to participate and, and, and like invest on the same terms as uh, you know, like the top institutional investors. And like, I'm not fully happy because it's US residents only and um, you know, like why I feel discriminated against. Uh, but uh, at the same time, you know, that's not their fault. That's um, you know, the fault of regulation. And, uh, but you know, it's still a big opportunity progress. Opportunity exists and they want yeah. this thing to happen as well. Exactly, and it's like a big, you know, it's a big progress, right? I mean, like, even that by itself, I think, is like a good example of you know, crypto ideals uh, really yeah, shining a bright light and uh, you know, like, kind of becoming a bigger part of the public consciousness. And uh, I think uh, you know, there is a really uh, still a good opportunity for the, some of those uh, brightest uh, parts of crypto to really shine through. And, uh, and I think um, you know, now we have more tools than before. We have um, you know, more um, abilities than before. Um, and uh, you know, we're entering into this uh, kind of second big great uh, decade of crypto. And it's also a very different world, right? It's um, you know, a world where the, the thing that's at the top of everyone's mind is not you know, the great financial crisis and, and the Fed. It is um, you know, AI um, and uh, you know, a, a whole bunch of totally different political stories and I mean, all kinds of things. And uh, you know, it's a uh, you know, very you know, different world. It's not a bad thing. It's just now. Exactly. It's, uh, you know, it's not a bad thing. It's, um, you know, it's changes. And uh, you know, changes are happening. And um, you know, changes may well happen again. I mean, like in, uh, in 10 years, we may, we, we may well be cycling back to an end the Fed arc. Like, I have no idea. <laughs> Um, so that's um, yeah. No, the, the basically just um, you know continue uh, you know being a, a, a great part of a yeah, great community, and I think uh, we yeah, have a great opportunity to you know, like work and build something great together. So my my final question to you is. Um, mm. Having uh, without ruining that blog post for others, you should definitely give it a read. Mm. Uh, what do you see yourself um, focusing on now as your role in this space? Hmm. What do you think is my role? I think it's still evangelism. Um, mm. High level ideas, mm. being able to actually make sure that people make mm. ethical decisions in this space still, and mm. actually promoting research. Okay. Should I make PRs to guess more? So, sorry, that one more time? Should I make PRs to guess more? Mm, when was the last one uh, that you made? That's a good question. I'm trying to remember. I feel like I did actually like. Put, I mean, to be fair, like I've never like even when I was like very active in development, I was doing Python and not Gath. I feel like I did a typo fix. I think like a year or two ago, possibly. So, uh, updating readme's doesn't count, Vitalik. Okay, okay. We, we know you're a contributor to Gath. Um, oh uh, no, I yeah, I made a PR to a PR to Gath. That counts. Um, this was, uh, I think, in the context, like in the context of like one of these gas cost DIPs. Yeah. Okay, that's cool. Yeah. Um, doesn't seem like you're all into that programming no, these no, no. days. I, actually, okay, I think, what, what else have I uh, done? Have I made a, uh, some simul some kind of, like, a, a bunch of prototypes, so, like one prototype of uh, roll-up uh, data compression. Um, one prototype of, uh, you know, definitely pro prototypes of like various uh, cryptographic algorithms. Um, yeah, I mean, like I definitely, um, you know, feel a, you know, a duty to kind of, um, you know, keep uh, playing, uh, playing around with the sword once in a while, and I um, mean, you know, like let the lightsaber not get too rusty and all that. Like it's, uh, yeah, there, you know, you don't. I think like, you, you might enjoy hackathons. You, I might enjoy what? Hackathons. Hackathons. Oh, interesting. Yeah, possibly. Um, Hmm. I don't know. Are there any hackathons happening anytime soon? <laughs> I think I know one that uh, I can uh, send you the details for. Okay. Sounds good. Depends on what you're doing tomorrow night. Uh, tomorrow night I shall be on a uh, plane to Hanoi, but... Uh, um, Your loss. <laughs> you're supposed to say S-F-Y-L. This is the cool internet lingo. I'm not hip enough. What does that mean? Sorry for your loss. Ah, so, oh, I see. 
<laughs> well, sorry for my own loss on this one. <laughs> No, no, come on. Like, memes are fun, right? It's like if you have a meme, you're supposed like, it's like it's rule 0x42. If there's a meme, there's a coin of it. Or, no, sorry, 0x34, right? Yeah. <laughs> it's a different one. <laughs> no, that's like if there's, no, that's like if there's a thing, there's a, there's a coin of it. Yes. Yeah. yeah. 0x42 can be if there's a thing, there's a meme of it. And uh, then, you know, you, there, if there's a meme, there's a coin of it. But that's as, uh, well, but this is just me being bad at the internet, so uh, it's Indeed, acceptable. Yeah, yeah, no, the, the internet is, uh, you know, it's a fun place, and uh, yeah. So, so uh, I do want to wrap up though, so you seem to excite, excited about a lot of experimentations and, and prototyping things, is, uh, is that what we can expect for the next uh, few years, or, or is there more? Um, yeah, no, well I think, um, you know, th there's, it's over the next few years, what even is, well there's, uh, you know, Verge, Purge, uh, still a whole bunch of good ongoing L1 stuff. Um, really fleshing out the ecosystem, obviously. Um, so, uh, you know, one of the other posts that I published a few months ago is, um, you know, making Ethereum cypherpunk again. And uh, one of the themes I have there is this idea of like building this, uh, of, like basically thinking of what we're doing as being uh, the task of creating a fully independent decentralized tech stack that competes with, uh, you know, the traditional centralized tech stack at every level, right? So. Uh, you know, they have Gmail, um, you know, we have, we had Skiff and, uh, you know, we shall have more. Um, you know, they uh, have uh, Twitter, we have Farcaster, they have DNS, we have ENS, they have, uh, you know, like centralized uh, re web to uh, recovery, which often doesn't even work. We have, uh, you know, like social recovery. Um, you know, they uh, have uh, Telegram, we have, uh, you know, like status and Warpcast DMs and a bunch of other things. Um, so, um, you know, like they have, um, you know, like credit scoring, we have, um, you know, like zoo pass attestations. DGEN scores. Exactly, yeah. So, like, basically, I mean, like, really thinking about it as, like, building out this, like, very coherent, decentralized alternative stack to, like, all of these core centralized, um, you know, like, internet finance and trust layers, and, like, really thinking about that holistically. And if you're building a thing in one layer, then, like, actually plug into some of the other stuff on, um, on those other layers, right? And, uh, you know, if you are a crypto project, then, uh, you know, be on uh, Farcaster. Um, you know, if you're building an app, if an app that requires signing into things, support sign in with Ethereum and support sign in with Zupass and support, you know, the, uh, the roadmap of eventually merging even those two things together into a more integrated whole. Um, you know, basically, yeah, you know, remember, like, you know, we're building this, uh, a whole um, ecosystem together. And I think it's, uh, you know, it's definitely growing bigger than just a blockchain. And I think that's a good thing. You know, blockchain is, uh, it's a great tool for what it's great for. Um, but, um, you know, zero knowledge proofs matter a lot too. Um, Two-party computation matters more and more. Fully homomorphic encryption is uh, going to start mattering uh, more and more. You know, proof of personhood protocols built on top of all of the above are going to start mattering um, more and more. So I mean, like, really start thinking of this as this um, you know big um, holistic system, and I mean, like, asking like, what are what part are you playing in it? Looks like you're going to just overall help make Ethereum cyberpunk again or crypto. Absolutely. So, yeah. Salik, thank you so much for that amazing chat. Thank you too, and I uh, really appreciate this.